I work for Kaplan Medical. I've been working as a faculty slash global director for almost about 16 years. And I had the beautiful opportunity of meeting students from all across the world. In Kaplan, we have almost about 98 countries representation so far, and we're still building up on more, despite the fact that we have COVID restrictions and travel bans in the past two years, two and a half years, we're still doing good. So right, without wasting much of your time, I'd like to say thank you for taking this time out. I know that people are joining in from all the parts of the world. So good morning, good evening, or some of you about to go good night, even in advance. So let's share the screen and then dive straight into the topic. Okay. One second. All right. Here we are. So today we'll be talking about understanding U.S. Assembly and residency matching process. So at the end of the session, most probably you would be at least having a bigger clarity on the whole process. AMO has been a very strong and uh, trustworthy partner in alliance with Kaplan Medical who has been supporting our students to get their rotations and get the letters of recommendations, especially now with the step one going, I mean, it's already gone, to pass and fail instead of digit scores. It is now imperative. It used to be okay if you don't have the letters of recommendation from the United States, it was not mandatory. But now that step one has gone off, your step to CK and even more, the United States medical experiences, right? USCE clinical experiences is more important than ever before, all right? Okay, let's talk about the pathway. I know that every session that I do, there will be some students who doesn't know anything about the pathway, they are interested, or there are some students who are already halfway the journey, but they may have some kind of doubts about new changes, new trends, and the latest kind of uh, updates from the ECFMG or the USMLE. So irrespective of which category you belong to, I'm just going to walk the way as if you don't know anything, because there's a famous saying, right? If you go with an open mind that I do not know, then you will know more things rather than saying I know, then obviously you have stopped yourself from asking inquisitive questions and getting more knowledge. All right, so this is you. You could be her or you could be him, right? And then you're interested in the U.S. medical residency. So first of all, you have to shake your hands and say hello to Educational Commission of Foreign Medical Graduates. You have to do the online registration with them, putting all the details fillable online. And then ultimately, once they receive it, they will send it for verification and certification to where? To the college or the university that you had, had you claimed that you graduated from. So medical school is going to come back to ECFMG by saying that, yes, sir. So whatever the student said is authenticated and verified. So please give the student an opportunity to take the exams. Once they receive the get go, then student will receive an email from ECFMG, which allows you to partake in the USMLE exam step one, CK and the OET. Once those three exams are done under your belt, then comes the application season, ERAS, Electronic Residency Application Services. It sounds very jargony, big, confusing, but just take it as an electronic platform where you can just, you know, send in all the applications and the programs and specialties that you choose during the application season, all right, with all the documents required, okay? So once the ERAS application has been sent in the month of September, the hospitals will receive it. And then once they receive it, they're going to filter it down. We'll talk about more of the criteria. Once the hospital has cut down and filtered all the candidates for the interview, then ultimately you will have to say hello to another platform called the NRMP, which is the National Residency Matching Program, which means you will have to partake in the rank order listings which means, let's say, for example, you have five interviews. I hope that you have 50 or 500 interviews for that matter, but just for sake of understanding, let's say you have five interviews, one in Texas, one in New York, one in California, one in uh, Idaho, let's say, right? So now in the month of February, after all the interview season is over, you'll have to sit down and rank which states or which programs or which specialties you went for interviews in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the chronological orders, right? So let's say you went to Texas. You did not really want to be there because the interview was not good. And then you felt like, you know, the aura and the place was not suitable for you. So let's keep Texas as number 10 and uh, number five. And then likewise, you get the idea, right? So rank number one, two, three, four, five. Based on that, 
At the same time, the programs are also ranking the candidates that they interviewed. So at the end, when it's a match, then you start your residency. The, um, the medical residency will take around three years and then surgical residencies typically take about five to six years. Once that is done, typically speaking, the US medical graduates, they take the step three before one year, uh, I mean, one year before graduating their residency period. But for an IMG, we normally recommend our medical doctors to take the step three, have the results in their pocket before they send the application, because that's going to be a tremendous boost for your chances to get into residency. All right. Now, step three is not conducted by the ECFMG. It is being overseen by Federation of State Medical Boards. So once you've finished taking the step three, what does it mean? It means that you have a license to practice medicine. That is, if you want to become a generalist or internist or uh, do not want to pursue your career in fellowship for now, then you can straight away practice. But of course, after medical residency, if you're interested in subspecialties, then you can continue doing your two years of fellowship in respective fields. All right. Now let's talk about the match timeline. So this is a quick recap of what we just talked in a faster way. One, CK, OET. Once you're done with these three, you will be certified by the ECFMG, which means two things. One, that you are now eligible to participate in the application season. Seasons start only once, right? This is the only one-time application season. However, step exams, you can take it in any order at any point of the time and date, so long it does not coincide with national holidays or local holidays, wherever the prometric centers are. So June, the ERAS tokens are distributed. And then once you have the ERAS token, then you have to start collecting and uploading all the documents in the ERAS portal that was assigned. September 15th onwards is the time that you are allowed by pressing the word, uh, by pressing your keypad enter, and then all your applications are going to shoot off to all the assigned programs and specialties. October to January end is the time that you will be getting so busy with a lot of interviews. And then in the month of March, somewhere in the middle, you will and you should be getting a beautiful email saying, congratulations, you matched in so-and-so program and so-and-so specialty. Typically, the residency starts in the month of July, but some of the hospitals and programs we've seen, they do their orientations even from mid of June. So it depends from state to state, program to program. And like I said, step three is not mandatory, but if you are an IMG who needs to be on a good visa, that is the H-1B visa, then step three is a must. Otherwise, if you want to do your residency, you need a visa and you don't have the step three, then you can still pursue your dreams should you be selected under J-1 visa, student exchange, I mean, international student exchange visa. All right, quickly, let's brush through understanding USMLE. Step one, I know that some of you guys must have already taken your step one and two, and then some of you guys are just here for getting the all-round picture of USMLE. So step one is the subjects that you got tested and learned when you were in the preclinical years, the basic sciences, anatomy, behavioral science, biochemistry, microbiology, immunology, pathology, pharmacology, and physiology. Like typically it's a seven subject exam, eight hours duration, and it's broken down into seven blocks. Like I said, last year, February, they changed it to pass and fail. So this is the first season that applicants would be coming up with a mixture of pass and fail result, I mean, pass result. And then they would also be population of some students who did not match this year, or you know those people, uh, those students who have taken uh, the step one exam before the change got placed. So this is an interesting time for the program directors to kind of see because INCAS, the organization decided to go with pass and fail for the benefit and for the advantage of the medical students. But the program director's offices are facing the turmoil and complication of how to select the candidates when one of the you know, scenarios of filtration tools, which is the scores, based on which they can just kind of decide who is better, who is not, even though it's not the perfect tool, but at least it is a tool that they had in the past, but now they're handicapped with that, right? So now it's pass and fail. So that remains to be seen. The data are yet to be done there. Uh, we are yet to get the data's full consolidated picture of how it's going to impact, but 
These are the things that we know for sure that step two CK is going to be now under microscopic lens ever before. Clinical knowledge, the last final years of your medical school years, internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, ob and psychiatry, five major topics in clinical world that will be tested in step two CK. Nine hours exam broken down into eight blocks. The passing score recently got changed this July to 214. Now, mind you, let me go back to step one. Even though it's a pass and fail, the passing score before it went to pass and fail was 190, 194, if I'm not mistaken. But there's a dark discussion going on. Nobody knows anything about it, but there's a lot of discussion going around what could happen. One of the major things that could happen, even though we don't know for sure, is that the passing score could be raised from 194 to somewhere higher. But by how much? It's up in the air, so only time will tell us. All right, OET, Occupational English Test, that mainly tests you on English proficiency and communication skills. Now, don't be so kind of frightened with the word OET, occupational, oh my God. It's simply the similar version of TOEFL and IELTS exam, okay? TOEFL and IELTS exam, they have the listening, reading, writing, and speaking sections. The same thing follows in OET as well. Now, I think you should be more happy because in the TOEFL world or IELTS exams, you would you could be listening to anything about going to Mars, scuba diving, hunting, cooking, and then you could be reading similar topics like dinosaurs, or you could be writing an essay which has got nothing to do with your livelihood. But in the OET, you will be listening, reading, writing, speaking, only medical, professionally related. For example, if you're listening section, then you could most probably be listening to a conversation between a physician and a patient. The patient complaining about, and the doctor is doing the physical checks, et cetera, et cetera. You know the whole nine yards. When it comes to writing, most probably you could be asked to write a patient's note, right? So now it's much more easier. The only barrier here is that if your English is not the first language and you have difficulty in understanding, then that could be a little bit of hindrance. Otherwise, m you know, most part of uh, when I talk with my students, I think this is a blessing in disguise. First of all, the CS was there where it used to be very costly, but now OET replaced. I think it, it's even more cheaper. It's I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's around 400 to $500. All right. After you get these three exams, like I mentioned earlier in the slide, you get certified by the ECFMG that allows you to take the step three. Step three, again, the subjects are the same subjects that you, uh, that you got tested on step two CK. Now, the question is, why do I get tested again and call that step three? Well, the biggest difference here is that step three is going to go a little bit more deeper into post-management, long-term patient care, complication, right? Because step three, like I said, is not required to you to become uh, a resident doctor, okay? But step three is primarily designed and created for you to have a license to practice medicine after you finish your residency. So there goes the difference. In CK, you just have to know up to the management. But in step three, post-management is going to be where they're going to look and test your knowledge about. Because now you are working as a licensed practitioner who is unsupervised, whereas it's in step two CK, while you're doing the residency, you are under supervision of your uh, attendings. All right, now, favorite question, how, how long is the average prep time? Honestly, the answer is, I don't know. And I'm being honest right now. But if I say, I don't know and leave it, then you guys are not gonna like me. So this is the average prep time for any international medical graduates. Step one, typically for nine to 12 months, CK, six to nine months, OAT, one to three months, depending upon your English scale. And then step three, three to four months, it can shrink down if your step to CK is pretty fresh and then pretty strong. Then I think you can squeeze in the step three preparation to less than three months as well. Now, one thing that I'd like to mention is while you finished taking a step to CK, if you're strong, I would definitely, while you're waiting for your ECFMG certification, all those things, it takes a good at least two weeks, uh, sorry, two months, right? So at least 
Once you take the step to CK, start preparing for step three while you're doing the US clinical rotations because you're more or less doing the same thing, right? You're studying medicine, ob all those things. And then you'll also be rotating, which is going to be much more fun because now it's going to be something hands-on that you have not been able to do for about a year and a half or two years in some cases, right? Because you are busy preparing for USMLE. So those are good news that you can have. Now, nine to 12 months, obviously, it's the base of the permit because obviously most of the IMGs, they face an uphill task in step one because they say that they graduated yesterday, for example. Even though you say you graduated yesterday, it sounds fresh. Yes, graduation date is fresh, but your step one, you have studied it when day one of your medical school year started. So that most of the countries that I've traveled to at least becomes around five to six years. So that's why it takes a little bit longer time to prepare and review the subjects that you have studied uh, during your first preclinical years of your medical school. All right, now let's go to the next topic how to get residency interviews. That's a perfect question, right? Because it's a wrong question to ask, how do I get residency? Because remember, this is the gate. <laughs> if you don't get interview, you don't get residency, period. Okay, so let's talk about how do I at least master and get the residency interviews? All right, these are the selection process you know, filterations or screening, whatever language each and every program uses, it's irrelevant, but this is the idea. For the residency program director and his cohort, there needs to be checks and balances about selection because typically any program in the United States receive approximately about a thousand plus applicants, applications during the residency uh, seasons. But of course, the average, you know, in medical uh, specialties, the average residency programs and seats available are anywhere from 10 to 13, right? So obviously 1,000 plus to 10 to 13, I'm not going to waste all my uh, time and my um, fac faculty's time to call all the 1,000. So there should be a selection in place. This is exactly how they use to select the candidates. The first cut always has been the scores, scores, scores. Even though pass and fail for step one, step to CK. Step three now even becomes more important. Now, let me pause here and kind of warn, because I know with a change of pass and fail, people normally are so elated, and then they just underestimate the step one exam, okay? Maybe he or she got lucky and passed the step one, but do remember, if you don't have a solid foundation concept of step one, step two CK, even though it's gonna test your clinical knowledge, it is laced and polluted with a lot of step one concepts. For example, they might start the question vignette by saying, 29 years old Jose from Mexico came with a complaint of blah, 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 times two weeks. And then on examination, we found boom, 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 boom. And then on auscultation, they might show you a PFT chart. And then on microscopic examination, they might show you a Petri dish. Now, if you do not remember those, if you do not have a strong concept of step one, there's no way in the world that you'll be able to answer that step two CK question. So, you know, boys and girls, be really careful about just brushing the step one and then jumping onto step two CK. All right, continuing, the second cut is your application package. Now, what does the application package contain? It contains United States clinical experiences, strong letters of recommendation, personal statements, which is very uniquely rich, talks about how great a candidate you are, research and publications, achievements and awards, and life experiences for some of you guys who are old graduates. Because these are small, small things, but it matters a lot. Score becomes the first level of elimination. Now, next is all about these, right? So that's where AMO comes in and joins hand with Kaplan to give you strong letters of recommendations. Now, strong, we do not guarantee that because in order to get strong, you need to perform very, very well as well. So whenever you get opportunities of rotations and observerships or Titanic ships or external, whatever ships that you want to jump on or virtual ships, right? Whatever, whatever ships that you want to join on, make the best use of that. Instead of just doing nine to five jobs that, okay, fine, I just need a letter of recommendation. You would rather want to utilize those to create a network with the physicians that you are 
you know, uh, dealing with on a regular basis. So make no mistake, it's not just that for you to get an LOR, but first of all, it has to be a strong LOR. Number two, just don't go there for one month, two months, whatever it is to kill time, but make sure that each and every day of your uh, relationship with them, you're building up a strong network so that they can push your application through and get your residency done. And obviously the interviews. I know a lot of students, they're great in communication skills, but there are some students who are very rocket scientist and nerdy who scores 10 out of 10 in every aspect of the questions. But due to lack of social and communication skills, they are not really able to perform during the interviews. So ladies and gentlemen, if you get an interview, that's a blessing. Do not screw it up. This is the last finishing line. Treat it as if you are there to impress the judges, be it Simon or American Scott Talent, but take it that way because each and every interview sessions are gonna last about 10 to 15 minutes. So make sure that each and every 10 and 15 minutes that you are in the room with the interviewee, uh, interviewers, make sure that you present your best. So sincere advice, don't take it for granted, don't memorize the answers, but have a flow. When you talk about certain things, have a transition, have a smooth transition, right? Do not sound like a robot. And then ultimately practice, practice, practice. So while you're practicing, not only practice with your friends, not only your friends, but I think you should interchange your friend because I always advise my students, like when they're preparing for interviews, they should not ask their father and mother to be there because you, you know them, even though you want to be prepared and dressed and all to be having the real feel but since they are there, when they ask you reading the questions that you drafted for them that you got from somewhere else, then it was like, oh, shoot. Okay, fine. Let's do that. So in order not to that, I mean, not to let that happen. So try to, you know, I wouldn't say buy, but try to get someone who's brand new to you. For example, you have two friends like Susie and Jennifer, right? Now, Susie knows a lot of other friends that Jennifer is not aware of. Same thing, vice versa. So if you are in the application or interview phase, then do yourselves a favor and exchange friends that the other person doesn't know, right? That's, that's a perfect tactic that I always tell my students so that they would be. Now, worst case scenario, if you do not find anyone, at least videotape yourself, okay? Videotape yourself through the cameras, through you know, laptop cameras, or even the smartphones, whatever it is. You would be surprised because interview is not only what comes out from your mouth. It is also the non-verbal you know, etiquettes that really counts. Because when we see the recordings later on, you will realize like, oh my God, I talk more, more with my hands. Because typically, psychologically speaking, when somebody is nervous, A, or B, when they are you know, challenged with the English language or any language they have to talk, and they are nervous, then automatically their hands appear out of nowhere. Until and unless you come from certain cultural background where you talk more with your hands. Typically speaking, it's advised that less the hand movements are, the better it is, because the interviewers are gonna look upon, they're gonna be distracted by it's like, oh, what's your name? It's like, oh, my name is Dr. Tenzin, I'm from da 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 It's like, am I supposed to listen to you or am I supposed to? look at a gesture. Are you trying to show me something? Right, get the point. And then last not the least, it's going to be after the interview sessions. Like I said, rank order listing. So be smart because at one point of time, many years ago, one of my students came up to me and said like, Dr. Stinson, I had 10 interviews, but I never matched one. I said like, how come? And it's like, oh, I did this. I did, this. we did, went through all the checkpoints. And then when it came to ROL, he thought, and then because he read it somewhere online forum, which I call it the ghost place, uh, where there are faceless people talking about things that they don't even know, or maybe they know half of it. So anyways, he came across a, a online forum message thread that when you do the rank order listing, even if you went for five interviews or 10 interviews, just put one or two, because there is a chance that you will be getting a, you know opportunity if you don't rank them. But the reverse is the case. If you went for 10 interviews, rank 10. Because if you don't rank them, you'll never be there in the listings at all, right? Okay, so make, uh, don't make that mistake. All right, now, after that, the, the main criteria of selection 
This is um, the interviews or survey conducted to almost all the program directors and those who responded. This is the importance of where the admission commission takes place. Step one score, obviously that is obsolete now, it's pass to fail, MSPE, medical school performance, and then step to CK, required clerkships, failed attempts, ranking, right? And then all those awards and clerkships and life experiences comes in. So these are important things that you should go back to nrmp.org, right? And then get those data. If you know the logistics, then you will know how to play the game. Because if you don't know this, you never saw this before, then it's like, yeah, maybe I have a strong this and strong that. Yeah, I am. that's it. But if you know the logistics and the importance of these data, then you will realize how to play the game to your benefit. All right, quick match data. All right, 27% of the doctors and surgeons working in the United States are IMGs, more than a quarter of it. You should be proud about it because when I first saw this about a couple of years ago, I was elated by saying like, yeah, IMG, go IMG, because I was an IMG at one point of time. So I'm proud to be participation, um, participating in that 27% of the physician workforce. Then obviously right now, before the COVID hit, they predicted a shortage of 125,000 doctors and surgeons. But with COVID happening, or happened, uh, hopefully soon, um, there would be even more demand of healthcare workers, including doctors. And then recently they passed last year, 1,000 increased position over the next five years. But you will see it in the next coming slide this statistics changes for our advantage. On the other side, when you look at the last decade, 2011 to 2021, not even a single year, there was a dip in the counts of IMGs getting matched into residencies. Not even one year, look at that. Now these are the good aura, good energy that has to sink in before the dejection and the pessimism that you go forward with like, yeah, I wanna do this, but do I, will I get a chance to get into residency? So these are the positive, optimistic energy that you have to imbibe and then walk forward strongly. Otherwise, if you go with half-heartedness and nervousness, your output is gonna be deterred, all right? Now let's look at the last match, 2022 match. 1,083, remember in the earlier slide, I said 1,000 residency positions will be spread over five years. Things changed because COVID happened and now, in this particular year of, you know, 2022 match, there was 1,083 more positions in the PGY1. That's first year of residency, all right? Only 41 more application, uh, applicants than last year. Now, this partly because of the travel ban, travel restrictions, and even though the program directors, they had a little bit of doubt about, okay, if I interview them and grant them J1 or H1B visa, they have to leave the country and come back. Now, would they be able to re-enter the country? So those are the little bit of fears that set in the program director's offices. And then that's why there were less applications. But anyways, for you guys, obviously what matters the most is the chances of you getting into residency entirely lies in your control. The ball is in your court. So obviously there's never been a better time for the IMGs. I know it's a tragedy with the COVID and monkeypox and I don't know how many poxes are going to come in later on. Hopefully not. Touch wood. Fingers crossed. But you never know, right? So obviously those people who are waiting on procrastinating and then say, yeah, I want to do this, but I have better things in life to do or I have to do. Just, just leave that aside and march forward to create your career and profession much more successfully. All right. Now, top specialties for non-US IMGs. I know this is not an important, but this becomes important because wherever I travel abroad, or in online webinar sessions, they ask me one typical question, Dr. Tenzin, is it true that IMGs or programs don't like, uh, surgical programs don't like IMGs? The answer is not true because there's nothing called like, love or hate in terms of you know, residency positions. However, it sounds like, or it looks like, primarily because of this data, right? Because wherever you hear people got into residency, they will mainly say internal medicine, family medicine, peds, pathology, psychiatry. There will be hardly less people. The main reason here is that supply and demand. 
the number of positions for surgical programs are way lesser in comparison to medical residency programs. That being said, it's even more difficult and challenging for US domestic students to get into those surgical residencies. And then whatever is left, and if your IMG candidate is very capable and then spectacular in his resume, then they get into it. So for example, it's not impossible. I never use the word impossible because that's not true. Just last year, one of my students got into ophthalmology residency, which is next to impossible, okay? This is how challenging it gets. Now, ophthalmology, radiology, dermatology, radiology, uh, orthopedic surgery, general surgery for that matter as well, ENT, those are competitive programs and mainly competitive because the word says it, it's highly, highly competitive even for the US medical students. Reason being the program positions and number of seats available are way lesser in comparison to the medicine um, uh, residencies. All right. Uh, now, why should you join Kaplan? I think it's a no-brainer. The question should be, why not Kaplan? Because we have been there, done that. We are the oldest player. We are the founder of test prep uh, exams all across. We have been there for almost about 80 years, historically speaking. And then for USMLE, we are the pioneer company setting up a trend of helping the medical doctors all across the world over 40 years, helping them get the best ac uh, educational support best academic resources, best faculties who are award winners and reputed institutions all across the states, right? So we have 24-7 support. And then the word, I mean, word USMLE and residency in the United States more or less becomes synonymous with Kaplan. So it's the biggest item, uh, biggest company, whoever prepares students from all across the world for residency. All right, now quickly through the course options, mainly three main options but again for the imgs generally speaking you know we i was also an img like i said we normally and you would nod your head if you're listening and watching me that we as imgs since our childhood when we went to school when we joined the medical school we learned best with friends in groups while quarreling on a topic fighting on a topic and then putting bets on questions which answer is right and whose answer is wrong Remember those days, right? So obviously, in-person is a much more better dynamic platform for IMGs. On-demand and online, they are normally designed for U.S. medical students and offshore Caribbean medical students. Now, I'll just give you an example. If you go to buy a car, let's brand name a Toyota or Honda. There are different models, right? There are SUVs, there are 16-wheelers, there are two-wheelers, there are and different categories there, convertibles, coupes, what have you. Each and every car model is designed for a separate target audience. So likewise, Kaplan also has Life Online, which is similar to what we are having right now, right? And then we have the On Demand, which is for your sake of understanding and simplifying it, Online is, uh, On Demand is a program which is similar to you understanding of Netflix account, right? You can subscribe for X number of months, and then these are pre-recorded videos of our faculties teaching every subject of step one, step two, and step three. All right. Now, the last is the in-center and live interaction with our faculty members in the state of New York, where I am currently based in. So like I said, on-demand, live online, and then in-center preparation. So I know that there could be a lot of detailed questions that you might have, which I'll be able to help you answer down the lane. All right, now these are the states. The red dots represents the density of IMGs getting into residency. So you look on the west side, California is big. Florida down there is big. Northeast side of New uh, the uh, US is also thickest, and then Chicago land. Now, when you look at the IMG friendly states, I know that some of you guys must be applying this coming season or some of you guys even might have already starting to apply right now this season. Um, so when you look at this, be smart of where you should apply. When it showed this, uh, this map to you, don't try to be, you know, just a bounty hunter trying to send an application in a boonie where there's very less chances because each and every application costs you dinero 
money, rupaya, paisa. So be smart of experiment. This is the last expenditure time for you guys when you send your applications. All right. Top 12 IMG friendly states to apply. But I'm not saying don't apply to any other states. Of course, if you do know some contacts and you know network, then go for it. Don't even look at the map. Just go for it. There's a higher chances there. Now, Tri-State, which comprises New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, these are the favorite hub of IMGs getting sucked into residencies. So when you combine these three states, which we call it Tri-States, then Tri-State, the combination of all these three states more or less becomes more than all the other states combined, if my math is right. Not that it's important that I have to be right or wrong, but just on a, on, on, on a blink, I can see that it is more or less on the higher side. All right, we are having our center located two blocks away from Central Park, four blocks away down to our Times Square, and then obviously you can visit the iconic Statue of Liberty. But again, I'm not here to give you a sightseeing tour of New York. I am trying to say that we, Kaplan Center is centrally located around these beautiful hospitals. I'm saying beautiful, not because of the looks or anything as such, but you know what I mean. Most of our students, they do their observerships. They land up into residency in these, these um, uh, hospitals and programs. And just because you have one senior who is now going into second year, third year, or chief resident from your country, from your university, should that person keep a good, clean image, and a great image for that matter, is even better, then obviously when this program director's office interviews you and ask you, where did you graduate from? If they see your name, the country, and your university or hospital that you graduated from, it goes a little step further into the liking, right, of the program. So that matters a lot. Now, why should you study and work in the United States? Well, I'm not the one who's going to force you to study and work in the United States. It's totally up to you. But just to give you the fun facts, accepted, USMLE is accepted in many countries that instead of taking the local medical board exams, if you do have the USMLE exams, they will consider that as the local entrance exams passed. State of the art medical training, of course, there's not nothing to kind of highlight that on. Everybody knows that. But the beautiful aspect of uh, the fellowship programs. I've contacted and talked to a lot of my colleagues all across the world. In many parts of the world, there are very less chances of people after finishing their residency getting into fellowship programs. Very few. But when you look into US, the chances of uh, fellowships are bountiful. And obviously, America leads in research opportunities. And lastly, after you finish your residency, your license or board certification is accepted almost in all the parts of the world. And, ladies and gentlemen, why you should study and work in the United States? It's because of this. Medscape 2022, that's the source that I got this from. And look at this. This is the money that you will be getting at the end of the day of hard work. But again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to show you the greed of the money. This is yours, whether you need it or not. It's kind of funny to share that at one point of time, two or three years ago, I was saying that to, um, to, the, to the audience. It was a live uh, presentation. And then I said, like, one, st one student just raised his hand and was like, sir, I don't, I don't need money. And I was like, perfect. I'll give you my bank account so you can just wire it whenever you get the checks. All right? But again, I'm not trying to be the Father Teresa or Mother Teresa. we saying, like, oh, I don't need the money, but you need it. Even if you don't need it, these are your hard-earned money that you can make yourself, make your life much more comfortable, and then that's going to make your family also happy and proud as well. I know this is the slide where most of the people just got and aroused their interest, right? And then they're just like, where's my smartphone? Let me take a you know, picture or let me do a screenshot. Well, it is a fact, right? All right. Towards the last end, I'd like to share a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who was a founding father and the president of the United States. And it really is profound. I take it by every day whenever things happened, right? If you want something in your life you've never had, let me repeat. If you want something in your life you've never had, you will have to do something you've never done. Very profound. You can be one of those six fishes in the left wars. 
and say like, oh, life sucks. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. Or you can choose to be that one fish who says enough is enough. I'm going to try something else. So the ball is in your court because as a human being, since the day we were born, we are full of sufferings and it will never cease until and unless you control that. Okay. So look at all the stressors in your life, write it down randomly. It doesn't have to be taught. And the next day, just put it in chronological order. What affects you the most? That's your second job, right? Second task, so to say. And then the third day, try to mitigate and put that into left and right column. Left column says, I have control over it. And then the right column says, I don't have control over it. And then try to put all those categories under, I have control or I don't have control. Now, those things that you have put under, I don't have a control, guess what? Don't waste your time worrying and repenting about your life because only time will heal. But for those that you put under, I have control, you know what? Don't blame or <laughs> blame or look for any other excuse. You have to stop everything and then work towards resolving this issue. Otherwise, all the other things are going to be backlogged. All right. Um, I'd like to share a special promotion of 20% off on Kaplan's USMLE On Demand and Life Online. For those students who have not yet registered or planning to register even in the coming few months, you can lock this discount of 20% off by putting a deposit of $500, right? It could be on On Demand. It could be on Life Online programs. So make a move. Promotion ends September 30th, 2022. All right. I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank Megan and team at AMO and, of course, all of you guys. Um, if you do have any questions, I'll take it up in the chat. And otherwise, if you do feel like sending me questions because you don't want to share it in front of everybody, this is my email that you can, you know, take it down or screenshot and I will take it from there. Awesome. Thank you. We did have some questions in the chat, so I'm going to try to go through them. Um, first question is, um, can you take and pass a USMLE before graduating? USMLE step one. Okay, let me pause here and say like USMLE exam was not originally designed for IMGs. Let's face that. It was already there for the domestic students. And then lo and behold, IMGs like you and I came and was like, hello, we're here. What are you going to do now? Are you going to give us another exam or are you going to give us the same exam? So then they said, instead of creating two exams, let them take the same exam. So typically speaking, a U.S. medical doctors, I mean, medical students, they study their preclinical subjects for first year and second year. Once they're completed with that, then they take a break and study intensively for USMLE step one. And with the results passed, then they go to the clinical years. Just like in many of the schools, you have the MBBS systems, prof systems, MD123 systems. So similar, it's just like, you know, after each and every preclinical exam is done, they take the USMLE and then they go on to the next level. Yes, the answer is yes, you can. Awesome. And then kind of just a piggyback off of that is, can you get the token before you have graduated? Token can be gotten because um, you need to, okay, it starts in June, right? By June, if you are not having anything under your pocket for your application, then I think you're just wasting your time and money, right? Because by June, you should at least have everything ready because time ticks. Because by the time ERAS opens, technically speaking, by now, everything should be uploaded, checked, confirmed, double check, confirmed, and then good to go. Okay, got it. So your advice would be for somebody that is maybe graduating in June, July, or August to go ahead and wait for the next next match cycle just to make sure you have every plenty of time to get everything that you need together. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, next question is: um, Will the OET consistently replace USMLE steps two CS? Step two CS is dead already, right? There's no way that it's going to come back. Sorry, I put a timer on myself. So it's already dead. It's buried. It's not going to come back. That I can guarantee until unless it's like a zombie coming up, which I don't think so. It's going to happen. Now it's replaced by OET. Now changes cannot be kind of confirmed, right? What will happen later on? I don't have the control. And honestly speaking, even the ECFMG, I don't think they know what they're going to do. 
Okay. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, were in regards to the interviews, do those typically take place in the United States or do you attend those online? I guess maybe with COVID, have things maybe changed a little bit? Right. During the COVID season, majority of the interviews were performed online through Zoom or like this. But now I've seen the programs changing more towards the in-person old school styles. But again, yet some of the programs, they still do the webinar session or online sessions of interviews. Okay, great. Um, next question is, is a good step one score still valuable in times of pass fail? And I think you kind of addressed that a little bit, just saying, you know, just your clinical knowledge, if you wanted to expand on that at all. Right. I mean, that being said, I think if you have already taken a step one, have spectacular score, me being a program director, I would prefer you rather than selecting somebody who's just passed because I know how beautifully you passed rather than somebody who just passed. And I was like, did you just barely pass or did you beautifully pass? But at least in your case, if you have a you know great score, I would have a proof that you passed wonderfully. Okay, perfect. Um, next question is, It is is it advisable to do rotations in hospitals you attend to match into later for residency? I mean, obviously, because at the end of the day, you're trying to procure the letter of recommendation or join the USCE. And this advice, I would like to give it is like, don't just go and get the letter of recommendation, but try to get the networking done, because that's more important than letter of recommendation. Letter of recommendation, you might get it. I mean, honestly speaking, I know students who you know, literally bought it in some third party companies as well. It's like they never went for rotations. Then it's like, hey, how much is that? 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. I'm not going to name names, but I know. But, you know, that's why we are we at Kaplan are really, really serious about these kind of practices. And that's why we don't generally partner with any Tom, Dick and Harry. And then obviously we entrust AMO to have a strict vigilance over that quality as well. Of course, of course. Um, next question is, um, is it possible to match um, with a year of graduation of more than 10 years ago? The answer is yes. Whoever is it, Diego Maradona or Di Diego Verano? Okay. Yes. So Diego, if you are 10 years graduate, yes, you are old. Okay. You're old. You have 10 years of wrinkles. But now, Diego, tell me you graduated 10 years ago after your medical school that you graduated, you finished your residency in surgery or internal medicine. That is for three to five years. And then after that, you worked for about two years because you have to feed your family and your loved ones. And then after that, you pursued PhD for three years. So that old is now beautiful old for me because you just constantly raise up your academic level. However, on the other side, if Diego was graduate of 10 years, but after that, he just fed his stomach, then that literally becomes a little bit tough job for me to select you over the other candidates, if that makes sense. Of course, of course. Um, then we did have a question in regards to research and publications, if there's an amount or, uh, I guess, something that would be able to get them noticed with research and publications. Research is great, but with publication. If you do say in your personal statement, I did research with Dr. Megan Fonster, and then I might ask you, where is it published? Well, it's not published yet. So it just becomes bland. So make sure that you are doing the research but making sure that it is going to be published by the time your season of application comes in. And you guys know it, like research doesn't get published overnight. It takes months, if not for years. Of course. So be really careful about that. Okay. And then I know that this is something that definitely a lot of visitors ask in the age of virtual rotations. Um, I think a lot of them have a lot of misconceptions that a virtual rotation is not as quote unquote, good as an in-person rotation um, or that it's going to be maybe frowned upon. Could you speak on that at all in regards to like this virtual age and how that is possibly going to continue within the U.S. medical system? For sure. I mean, thanks to, I mean, first of all, telemedicine and virtual medicine was already there pre-COVID. Let's, let's have to, we'll have to admit that, but it was not on a large scale. But that was kind of new. So people frowned upon whether the quality is going to be good or not. But COVID just kind of changed the whole game in every industry for that matter, right? In the teaching format. I mean, you guys, whoever is asking if you were in medical school during those times, 
you just transitioned from in-person learning to virtual learning all of a sudden. You had to adapt it. So coming to your question of, is it frowned upon? No, not at all. Because remember, even the US medical students during the COVID lockdown, they had to attend the online classes just like you did in the parts of the world that you are. So I talk and interact just like AMO's team with a lot of programs, officers and directors and chairs. And this was one of my main agendas in those times. And it's like, are you gonna look and weigh less for the telemedicine or telerotations? And it's like, hell no. Because nowadays telemedicine is growing into a big giant industry. So for you, telemedicine, telerotation is as equal as in-person uh, practices for getting the USCE. 